Good morning, everyone. It's good to see each one here. We're thankful for your presence, and we hope that the next few moments will be profitable for you as we go together and study a portion of the Word of God and seek to make application of it into our lives so that we'll be the kind of people that God would have us to be. I want to begin our lesson by looking at the Apostle Paul and what he wrote to the church at Corinth. He concluded his initial letter to that church by summarizing his purpose in writing by using five imperatives. In 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, beginning in verse 13, Paul said, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, let all that you do be done with love. Each one of these imperatives is worthy of our study, for these are qualities that we need to have in our lives, that we need to be those individuals that watch. We need to always stand fast in the faith, to be brave individuals, serving the Lord with courage, with strength, and always to do whatever we do in love. But for our lesson this morning, we want to look to that first imperative, watch. It should be of great importance to Christians today. Now, this word, watch, in our English language, in the Greek language, for which the New Testament was originally written, it is the word Gregorio. And it means to watch, that is, give strict attention to, be cautious, active, to take heed lest through remissness and indolence some destructive calamity suddenly overtake one. This gives us insight as to what this word is about. It's not just looking, but it's looking with purpose, giving strict attention to that which we are to watch. To be cautious, yes, we need to be very cautious in what we're doing and how we're living. But we also need to be active individuals, actively watching, actively doing the will of the Lord, looking to Him, looking to His will, so that we'll be the kind of individuals that He would have us to be, not to be remiss in our service to Him, and not to be indolent, lazy, and allow something destructive to come upon us. So in our lesson this morning, we're going to consider why the Christian needs to constantly be vigilant. And so the simple title of our lesson is Watch. We're going to start by considering things for which we must watch. And they are many. We must watch for opportunities to serve Christ. The sin of omission will cause a good number of people to be lost. A sin of commission is where you commit an act of sin. A sin of omission is where you don't do what you're supposed to do. Him who knoweth to do good but does not do it, James tells us, to him it is sin. So we need to know and to understand that the failure to do good is sinful. As I quoted James, therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. If I know what the Lord would have me to do, but yet I fail to do it or am remiss in doing it, I'm not pleasing unto Him. Matter of fact, I've reached the point where I'm sinning against Him. The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 said, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. That's the act of watching, to be that individual who doesn't grow weary in watching, doesn't grow weary in doing the good that the Lord would have him to do. You see, the Bible presents those who were lost because they failed to serve as Christ or as God would have them to serve. In the parable of the talents, there is the one talent man. That master was going off into a far country and he left with his servants those things that he had would have them overlook. To one man he gave five talents, to another two talents, to, and to this man he gave one. Well, when he returned, he expected an accounting of what had been done with that which he left with his servants. Well, the five-talent man had gained him five more. The two-talent man had gained him two more, and both were, rec were recognized by their master and commended by their master. 
But this man, he came to his master and said, well, I know you're a hard man. You reap where you don't sow and, and gave him all kinds of excuses. But you have what is your own. He had hidden it in the ground and nothing came from it. And the master called him a wicked and slothful servant. When we fail to serve Christ, to do those good works for which we are created in him, according to Ephesians 2 and verse 10, we are those wicked and slothful servants because we're failing to do what the Lord would have us to do. There's also the goats that we see later in this chapter, Matthew 25, where Jesus depicts the judgment scene for us. Those on his right are the sheep. Those on his left are the goats. The sheep were given entrance into the eternal abode because he said, I was hungry. You fed me. I was thirsty. You gave me to drink. I was in prison. You visited me. Naked, you clothed me, etc. Lord, when do we do all these things for you? When you did it for the least of these, my brethren, you did it for me. But then he turns his attention to those on his left hand, the goats. <laughs> as much as those on the right hand had done, these had not done. I was hungry. You didn't feed me. I was thirsty. You didn't give me anything to drink. And he goes on. This lets us know we need to be actively serving the Lord. And we need to watch for opportunities to serve the Lord. Because we can lose our souls if we're not serving when we have the opportunity to serve. Therefore, we need to constantly watch for occasions to serve. They include such things as teaching the lost, restoring the fallen, aiding those who have needs, as we see there in Matthew 25. So all of these are opportunities to serve the Lord, and a failure to do so, a failure to do good, adversely affects our opportunities to lead others to Christ. Because these things must be done out of love. And Jesus said, by this, all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another as I have loved you. So we must watch out for the opportunities to serve and not neglect them. We must also watch out <laughs> for false teachers. The Apostle Paul warned the elders of the church in Ephesus while he was meeting with them in the city of Miletus to watch out for false teachers among them. In the 20th chapter of the book of Acts said, therefore take heed to yourselves to all the flock among you which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. We must watch out for those who would teach another gospel as we see oops, in uh, Galatians chapter uh, 1, verses 6 through 9, that there were those who were perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ and pre preaching, in essence, another gospel. And I better quit doing that. Uh, and the thing is, they were going to be damned because of it. He said, though anyone teach or preach another gospel, they're anathema, accursed. And false teachers, you see, bring damnable heresies and must be exposed and rejected. And the mouths of false brethren must be stopped. Titus chapter 1, to this young preacher, Paul wrote in verse 9, Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. For there are many sub insubordinate both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision or of the Jews, whose mouths must be stopped to subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. But how can we know and watch out for those who are teaching that which is false? By going to the Word of God. Because it tells us what is good, what is true, what is right. Heresies abound. We must watch for Satan he uses cunning devices to ensnare us. Those devices are exposed to us in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. He said of uh, some who were trying to bring about the demise of the church in Corinth, 
for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So we must watch out for that. We must hold fast to the word of God. We must cling to it and always stand for it. We must watch out for worldliness. There's so many ways that Satan seeks to ensnare us. But he seeks to ensnare us through the lusts of our flesh. Therefore, we must constantly be on watch. Satan will use such things as division, even among God's people. If we look to the works of the flesh, which are presented unto us by the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 5, in verse 20, it talks about divisions. Okay? New congregations, sadly, sometimes are only factions. The people can't get along with one another. And Satan has filled the hearts of some. And so they split off from one another. There's the matter of the immorality, also one of the works of the flesh. Pornography, immodesty, adultery, those things such as that. These are things that are worldly in nature, fleshly in nature. And in our lecture series we've just had, we talked about, we talked about the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. And this is the work of the flesh, desiring to do what one wants to do in spite of the fact that it is against the will of God. And then there's drinking, carousing. And some, even the Lord's people, want to justify it and say it's fine. But yet, if we're going to be the type of people that God would want us to be, we must reject all things that are worldly. For entanglement in the affairs of this world is another pernicious evil of which we must be aware. 2 Timothy 2, verse 4, No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Andrew Roberts brought us a lesson during our lectureship where we are told that we are to put on the whole armor of God so that we might stand against the wiles of the devil. That means we are soldiers of the Lord. We're in the army of the Lord and we are not to give ourselves over to just thinking primarily of the things of this earth the things of the here and now. We are individuals who are involved in a great fight against principalities, against wicked hosts in spiritual realities. We need to be those individuals who give ourselves first and foremost to the Lord and to his cause. In Luke the 8th chapter, verse 14, Jesus explaining the parable of the sower now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. These are individuals that seemingly have given themselves to the Lord, but in reality, they are overtaken by the things of this world. Those things might not even be sinful in and of themselves, but they give their priorities to them, and that's when they become wrong. The cares, the riches, and the pleasures of life. We talked about Moses in our Bible class this morning. Moses, according to Hebrews chapter 11, chose to share ill treatment with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. We need to have that kind of mindset about us. We need to be those individuals who will be willing to stand up and serve the Lord in spite of the fact that we may not be appreciated for it. Matter of fact, there might be some persecution against us. So we need to watch out for worldliness in our own lives and with others. We need to watch out for Christ's return. Jesus repeatedly taught that people need to be always watching for his return. When he ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives, he promised to return. In Acts chapter 1, verse 10, while they, his disciples, looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, 
who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus ascended back to the Father, and he's sitting at the right hand of God with all power and authority in heaven and on earth. But also, presently, he's gone away to prepare a place for us and has promised to come again to receive us unto himself. He said, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. I, if it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. That where I am, there you may be also. We need to have that faith, that assurance, that Christ will come again and bring us to him. But he will also come again to render vengeance against the wicked. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, And to give you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power when he comes in that day, to be glorified in his saints, to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Go back and look at the first portion of this passage. He will be taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and I believe do not have a relationship with God. There are many people in the world that do not have a relationship with God because they don't know God. Remember from our Bible class, we just studied that one of the reasons that God brought ten plagues upon Egypt and Pharaoh was that he, Pharaoh, might know God because... <laughs> When Moses first approached him, Pharaoh said, Who is this God? I do not know him. By the end of that tenth plague, Pharaoh knew God. And Pharaoh knew that God would take vengeance upon him. Those who do not obey the gospel. How sad it is that there are people today who do not know God. Very recently in the news, a very liberal-minded person, lady, and I use the term accommodatively, that was on the U.S. women's soccer team, Megan Rapinoe. In her last game, she hurt her ankle. In her press conference afterwards, she said, and understand she is an atheist, why, if there is a God, this is proof that there is no God that God on the last game that I'm going to play would bring me down like this. Well, I'm sorry, but evidencing her life, maybe that's an indication there is a God because she sought to do great harm against God and against this nation. We need to be individuals who believe in God because God is coming back. And he's coming back with his angels in flaming fire. And he will render vengeance upon those who do not recognize him. You know, the early church lived in anxious expectation of Christ's return. 1 Corinthians 16.22, O Lord, come. Revelation 22.20, even so, come, Lord Jesus. And I believe this is a characteristic of the early church which we need to restore. Some people go on, even Christians go on every day. Like this world will always continue. This world is not always going to continue. It's going to come to an end. And we need to be prepared for that or for Christ's return. But there were those back at that time who soon decided that Christ was delaying his coming and not coming at all. 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4, knowing this verse, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. I think there are people like that today. Hey, 
It's been over 2,000 years. If he was going to come, he would come. No. Jesus warned of the tendency to become convinced that one has more time to live as he or she pleases. That attitude that Jesus will not come tonight leads to such things as entanglement in the affairs of this world and worldliness. Look at Luke chapter 12, verse 42. The Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Are we watching for the Lord's return? Are we expecting the Lord's return? Do we think it's not going to come and we can do whatever we want in the meantime? No, there are many reasons to watch for the Lord's return. They include such things as, He's coming will be sudden. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're told in 1 Corinthians 15. His return will be unexpected as a thief in the night, according to 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. Therefore, our only security is to always be prepared for His return. For the consequences of being unprepared are dire. As we've already seen, he will deal out retribution at his second coming. And those who do not love the Lord or obey the Lord will be under his curse. Therefore, if we are to watch, how are we to watch? How are we to be prepared? Obedience. Obedience to the gospel for the cleansing of one's sins causes one to be prepared. The one outside of Christ needs to obey the gospel. The Christian who has erred needs to repent and do their first deeds. All of these things are important if we're going to be prepared and watching for Christ's return. So when the Apostle Paul used the singular word watch, it has a lot of meaning. Because the blessing of God resides on the vigilant Christian, therefore each one of us needs to watch. Revelation chapter 16 verse 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. <coughs> to keep his garments pure and white and to cover himself in the glory of the Lord. Those who are unprepared, we will see their shame. The question is, are you watching? Are you watching for all these things? But especially, are you ready for the Lord's return? If not, you can be by the time you leave this building. If you'll acknowledge your sins, repent of them, and seek to live as God would have you to live. If you've never been baptized, baptism into the waters, in the likeness of Christ's death, will bring you salvation of your soul, purity, and justify before God. Or if you're one who claimed to be a Christian and you haven't been living, watching as you should, we want to help you. Should you need to make your life what it should be for the Lord, we encourage you to do so by coming forward while we stand and while we sing. Great day coming, a great day.